We are on kick. You can come join us if you want. If not, that's cool. Just leave a like, comment, subscribe. Turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. If we do go live and you happen to miss it over on kick. This is where you can catch the highlights, man, the lit one live. Um, also, we do got the Patreon. You can, uh, you can, uh, you know what I'm saying? Catch anything that we can't post on YouTube on there. And we also got the Discord. The Discord is going to come into heavy play. Because on Kick, you can't send links in the chat. For now, at least you can't. Um... But you can definitely, you know, send me some links on Twi on here. Hopefully you can integrate it. You probably can. I don't know. I've never done it anyway. But today, we I, I'm trying to structure what's going on on the channel, man. So on today, it's Wednesday. We're going to move all documentaries to Wednesday. So this is, okay. So I, all right, I ain't even going to waste y'all time. But documentaries are Wednesday now. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? You're going to get at least one documentary. And it got to be like something like, I don't want to force the, the force to force it. If it ain't a documentary out that's worthy, I ain't going to watch it. But, but here we go. Yeah, I want to watch this one. Nottingham's first and only serial killer. When life means life. Murder documentary UK. Let's get into it. Walls. If you see me peering this way, my screen is this way. My stream setup is right in front of me, but the stream where I can see everything without no interruptions is right here. For almost all of these, the aim is rehabilitation and release. But a tiny number are deemed so dangerous and depraved that they will never be freed. This extraordinary group of 45 men and one woman includes serial killers, torturers, hired assassins, the press, killers. Is that the intro? Laters. Mark Martin. What is this? And oh. Ernest Wright. They were both notorious for controlling vulnerable people. And the only way he could sleep with her was to get rid of Trevor. So he got rid of Trevor. And committing brutal crimes. A half-hearted effort had been made to bury them, one on top of the other. Ernest Wright was a career criminal who murdered twice, almost 40 years apart. I kept telling myself, I don't want to die in this street, I don't want to die like this. While Mark Martin killed three women in just a matter of weeks. When we start to receive information that had been bragging about killing other girls, have we stumbled across a serial killer? Both were capable of extreme violence. <laughs> When we entered the premises, we were faced by a, a scene of real carnage. We found the teeth of the person and bones. And both have been told they will never be released. Okay. Bradford, West Yorkshire. Thief. Just note, all of these always start off in Yorkshire. I don't know what it is with Yorkshire, yo. I, yo. Initial c came in about 10 to 8 in the morning. A man had been shot dead in the Ashbourne Road area of Bradford. A second man had been shot and was lying critically injured on the ground outside the premises. The suspect had escaped from the scene wearing a, a full balaclava and brandishing a sawn off shotgun. And I can remember thinking it was extremely unusual that, uh, that this sort of thing would happen on a Monday morning at 10 to 8 in the morning. On a Monday morning at what time? Would happen on a Monday morning at 10 to 8 in the morning. Many of the witnesses uh, had been young children on the way to school, many of whom would have been very much traumatized by what they'd seen, very, very graphic scenes. Of, of the killing taking place. What they'd witnessed was a violent attack on two young men. Neville Corby and his ex-partner Craig Freer had been shot in their own home. Detect when they say partner, do they mean like relationship? Detective Superintendent Chris Thompson 
went to the scene to investigate. When we entered the premises, we were faced by a, a scene of real carnage. The shootings had taken place um, throughout the premises. The body of Neville was on the, on the landing. He'd been pursued from room to room and had been shot uh, on numerous occasions. Craig had been shot at point blank range. He'd escaped via a very small um, bathroom window. There were blood trails from the window and it had dropped. Hey man, I'm gonna keep it a buck with you, man. In America, when I was in Chicago, I used to walk around the crib with my blick on me. Inside the house, with it on me. I ain't gotta go nowhere to get it. It's on my person. You know what I'm saying? Because this is this is a hey, stuff like this, not not like in a serial killer sense, but like people B and E all the time, breaking and entering in Chicago all the time. Like I was in the hood. When somebody kicked my door in at any time and I'm definitely armed and ready. What the hell? It's considerable distance to the ground. His injuries were critical and, and were clearly life threatening. <laughs> a few yards from his home, drifting in and out of consciousness. Craig Freer managed to utter a few crucial words. He'd been able to tell uh, people treating him at the scene uh, that Ernest Wright was responsible for the shooting. It was a brutal crime. One man was dead, another critically injured, and a gunman was on the loose. Bradford police launched a citywide manhunt for their suspect. But who was Ernest Wright? Born in the Bradford suburb of Shipley in 1941, Ernest Leslie Allen Wright was always destined for a life on the wrong side of the law. It was apparent that uh, Ernest Wright was a, a career criminal. He began committing crime at the age of eight years old. Wright was following in the footsteps of his parents. Theft was a family business. Okay, I'm looking like eight years old. What are the, what are the parents doing? Well, you know, this, they was doing the same thing. And the first time he was caught stealing a collection box, Wright was alongside his mother and father. Kerry Danes is a forensic psychologist. She studies criminals and what motivates them to commit their crimes. If you're born into a criminal family, then you've got very little chance of not becoming a criminal yourself. Let's look at the role models that Wright was given. At the age of eight, his parents were using him as an accessory to stealing collection boxes. So here is a child that's got no rules, no boundaries, no guidelines for the future. So his behaviour is only going to escalate. And it did escalate. Wright was in and out of court and soon graduated from approved schools to Borstal and he continually broke the rules. One of the things about him was he was also a prolific absconder and uh, had escaped on. One of the things about him was he was also a prolific absconder and... Uh, the hell is absconder mean? Uh, ...had escaped on numerous occasions. As he got older, Wright found himself in adult prison. When you're working with disturbed children, you know that what is going to ultimately make the difference to them as an adult is whether they respond to treatment or not. Now, Wright didn't respond to anything. He bounced in and out of ball stalls and special schools, and actually, he tended to abscond from most of them, so he wasn't going to be contained in any way, shape, or form. Mm, okay, so like he just like didn't show up to a lot of stuff. Ran away, avoided, ditched. Hey Siri, uh -huh. what does absconder mean? Okay, I found this on the web for what does absconder mean. Check it out. Can't even show me nothing. Hey Siri. I mean, I guess you don't want to tell. Um. And in 1968, Ernest Wright was again on the run. But with his face well known to West Yorkshire what policemen, he travelled south to lie low in the town of Aylesbury. Wright bought a caravan and lived on a disused airfield, away from prying eyes. 
But before long, he was back on the police radar. The case began when senior investigating officer Maurice Caro visited a patient in a hospital. Ruth Hale was making a muddled claim that her husband had been missing for over a year. I kept saying, where's Trevor? Trevor's burnt. Trevor's burnt. Who burnt Trevor? Trevor's burnt. And this was the end of the conversation. A girl doesn't suddenly start talking about her husband being burnt. Something had happened to that lad. But what it was, we had to find out. Maurice did some digging on the estate where Ruth and Trevor lived. He discovered that Ernest Wright had started an affair with Ruth, behind her husband's back. Soon afterwards, Trevor had disappeared. And Ernest Wright had moved out of his caravan and into the Hale family home. So Maurice and PC Paddy Dunn paid him a visit. We went upstairs. Wright was ill in bed. He was laid there flaked out, couldn't talk, staggering all over the place when we got him up, kept falling down. That's too much. So we had to virtually hold him up, carry him. They're going to have to fix this. Y'all can type a whole goddamn paragraph at this point. This is just going to keep going. Uh, okay, I think I know what it is. I'll fix it later. Not right now. Him downstairs, and he, he looked really out. There's something about him that didn't smell right. Now, I couldn't understand why Ruth had fallen in love with him. But as Wright was led to a waiting police car, he suddenly sprang into life. Paddy came dashing back in. I'm sorry, Gov, he's done a bloody runner. Wright clearly had something to hide, but once again, he had tripped the authorities and got away. I must admit, he conned me. And that's why I left Paddy to take him, thinking he had no problem with him. Wright had now absconded from Borstal, escaped from a prison cell, and run off from under the noses of senior detectives. But was he responsible for the disappearance of Trevor Hale? In Aylesbury in 1971, career criminal Ernest Wright was on the run from the police. They suspected he was linked to the mystery of a missing local man called Trevor Hale. But faced with arrest, Wright gave police the slip and vanished. <laughs> yeah, the reconstruction. Hey, whoever was doing that reconstruction running, he is not getting away from nobody. He was slow as hell. Senior investigating officer Maurice Caro discovered Wright was a prolific escaper who was on the run from prison. With no time to waste, Caro and his team launched a manhunt on the estate. They quickly learned that Wright was likely to be holed up in a nearby house and could be armed. For a second time, Morris and his team went to make an arrest. I sent the lads round the back to cover him jumping out of the window. Banged on the door, and after quite a long knock, a man answered. When he opened the door, I saw a right at the back of the house. I ran in, straight in, and as I went in, he put his hand to his jacket, and I thought, he's going for a gun. So I hit him. Right was pretending to be unconscious. We dragged him out, put him in the police car, and we take Wright to the Nick. With Wright safely under arrest, the police could finally question him about his relationship with Ruth Hale and the disappearance of her husband. Ruth had fallen out with Trevor, and Wright, who was in the house, suggested to Trevor he goes and stays with him at his caravan. The tears were coming, they were flowing, as he told me how Trevor was asleep with a sleeping bag over his head. He then went and got a big iron bar. He then beat Trevor to death. He went outside, 
built a bonfire, poured used engine oil on it, put Trevor on top. Damn! He then went back to Aylesbury, where he picked Ruth up. He took Ruth up to the airfield. She saw Trevor on top of the fire. He then set light to it. And Ruth was made to stand and watch her husband being burnt. Yo. I ain't gonna lie, did he barbecue them? That's crazy. I'm not even trying to be funny, but that's wild. That's some real ruthless type. You get me? Like, that's like. They're moving crazy at that point. I think it was important for Wright to bring Ruth in so that she could actually see what had ultimately happened to Trevor. And I think it's important on two levels. One, it's saying, look what I am prepared to do for you. So it would have made her feel indebted in a way. But also, it sends a very clear message. This is what I'm capable of. If I can do this to Trevor, then I can do it to you too. Morris had a shocking confession, but he needed proof that Wright was telling the truth. Forensic teams were sent to the scene in the search for Trevor's body. One of them was John Bailey. The sergeant and I both came out on this one, being a murder. Close to Wright's caravan, they found evidence of an open fire. And just beneath that, there'd been a hole dug. It seemed Wright's bizarre story just might be true. Not a very nice job, but uh, day in, day out, we had our fork, knife and fork, and we were sifting through the contents. A lot of it was pretty mucky, you can understand, if oil and wood, hairs and fibres and tiny little pieces, and you've always got your magnifier in your pocket. But despite the primitive techniques available, John and his team soon made a grim discovery. We found the teeth of the person. <laughs> and um, bones. <laughs> it's not very nice at all. Some of these jobs, I wonder how like one person just does these jobs. Like, you feel me? Like, you just sift through remains all day looking for teeth and bones. Then you go home and have a Sunday roast. It's crazy to me. We pieced it all together and made a human body of it and de de decided what age the person was. Uh, so all for evidence. The approximate age matched that of missing Trevor. It was enough to charge Ernest Wright with his murder. And despite denying it in court, Ernest Wright was found guilty and given a life sentence. To me, it was just an insipid little man who thought he was in love with Ruth, and the only way he could sleep with her, or live with her, was to get rid of Trevor. So he got rid of Trevor. On his shoulder. Wright thought he could get away with murder, but his manipulation of Ruth had backfired, and he was once again behind bars. I don't think that Ernest Wright was a particularly bright guy. But I think that he was certainly socially savvy enough that he could manipulate everybody around him and that aided him in the commission of his crimes. Now, it's very common for criminals who maybe don't have other resources to use manipulation. Now, the case of Mark Martin is a very different one. He's a very different character, but manipulation is certainly at the heart of what he does. It's two different people, if y'all didn't notice. In 2004... The city of Nottingham was working hard to shrug off an image of high crime. Newspapers had branded it the gun capital of the UK. But just three weeks into 2005, murder would once again hit the headlines. The fire brigade called to a block of disused flats known locally as Marple Square. There was a blaze and it was a real ferocious fire. It took them some time to put that fire out, and when they did, what they discovered inside was some bodies. A, a dead female. The victim was Ellen Frith, a local girl who had been part of the homeless community. Both of these people like to do, like, burn, burn stuff? Tea. 
the block of flats where she was found had recently been abandoned and taken over as a squat. DCI Rob Griffin launched an investigation into what had happened. The fire service assist us massively with that because they're experts in why fires have started and that, what they were telling us from the very start was that this fire was no accident. It looked as if paper had been stuffed in particular places uh, and then a naked flame had been used to set fire to them. Lots of inflammables inside the flat and the, and the whole place took hold. First indications were that Ellen had been the victim of arson, so police began to investigate. We were soon able to put together a picture of who had been in that flat the day before and the day of the fire. We knew that Ellen Frith had been in there. And we knew also that Dean Carr, John Ashley and Mark Martin had been in there. And we were quite... So were they just squatters or were they like... Nitties too, like, what's, what's going on? I like to use y'all term because it's, it doesn't sound much as aggressive as what I want to say. Sure that they'd all been there at the time the fire had started. Police quickly established the three men were all living rough in Nottingham. But one man stood out from the crowd. His name was Mark Martin. He was a recent arrival on the homeless scene and had been on the streets for just two months. He had been married and had a child. But with the relationship broken, Martin had moved to Nottingham in November 2004. Charity worker Grant Wallace had been one of the first to meet him. He was quite unusual at the time. He was hanging around with a, a lot of homeless people that had been kind of entrenched in that lifestyle for a long time. He was kind of smart, um, seemed to have money and no major issues, so he kind of stood out from the crowd, really. Martin had moved from nearby Ilkeston to live on the streets, but to Grant, it didn't quite add up. <laughs> what do you mean he stood out, he had money, but he wanted to live on the street? I'm lost. I understand he went to a divorce, split, wife probably got the crib, he moved to Nottingham, okay. The people he was hanging around with had major uh, alcohol and drug issues, really. Right. Uh, quite long-standing ones. He didn't seem to. Um, I saw him drink the occasional can of beer, um, but he never seemed drunk or out of it. He always seemed quite on the ball. He didn't quite fit in. So what, he was making a conscious choice to be here? Like, not out of necessity, out of want or something? If he wasn't kind of joining in with them on the same kind of things and that, what, what was he there for? And, what, you know, why, why was he hanging around with them? Mark Martin's physical appearance also made him memorable. He's a huge man, both in terms of his height and his build. He's a big, strong-looking man. People were frightened of him. People looked at him, they were intimidated by him, and they were frightened of him. He used to make a big deal of putting his leather gloves on in front of you, like, I don't know, quite theatrical, really. I think we all got the impression he's quite manipulative with other people. Because he had a bit of money in that, he, he had a bit of sway with people as well. Mark Martin made a choice to join the homeless community, and that gave him access to vulnerable people, people who so could that, be... That was my next question. Like, what the, What was he doing? So Mark Martin was... a try-hard bully... He was out here trying his hardest. To, he moved in with a vulnerable community to pick on people, to find the most vulnerable people in life and played games with them, used them for his social whatever he had going on, for his own type of therapy. Be manipulated literally on the price of a cigarette or a can of beer or whatever. He was able to go in there without a history and maybe act in ways that wouldn't be tolerated in other parts of society. Police quickly discovered that Mark Martin had a criminal record for dishonesty and violence. For such a big man and a big strong man, never really did we have anybody describe a physical confrontation between him and another man. All of his wasn't violence was focused upon females. 
police hunted for Martin and the other two. He sound like a B I T C H to me. I ain't even gonna hold you. That's what he sound like to me. Nothing about this man seems, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You big as hell. You went through a divorce. We know why your wife left you after hearing all of this. You was a bully. And then you went and moved to the homeless community when you didn't have to because you wanted to be around more vulnerable people. You wanted to be the king. You wanted no pushback from nobody. <laughs> and then even in the homeless community where everybody is vulnerable, you did not pick on the vulnerable men. You picked on the vulnerable women. Men. The first to be found was John Ashley, who told a dramatic story. Okay. His version of events was that the four of them had been in the flat that night and that Mark Martin had decided to strangle Ellen Frith whilst the two looked on. The arrest of the second man... And what y'all did? Y'all just looked on, didn't do nothing. Because, like, I... Like, cause, okay. Dean Carr offered a different version of events. Interestingly, he blamed both Martin and Ashley. He said that Mark Martin had strangled Ellen and that John had finished her off. Finally... Mark Martin was tracked down and questioned about his role in Ellen Frith's murder. Well, Mark Martin, he decided that he wasn't going to answer any questions, and so throughout the whole of his time in the police station, he never spoke a word. But Martin hadn't been so tight-lipped out in the community. Several witnesses came forward, claiming Martin had admitted the murder and even seemed proud of what he'd done. It's not very often where somebody murders another that they go on and tell people about it. But he was doing more than that. He was telling anybody that would listen. I, I, I'd say he was boasting about it, yeah. Just days after Ellen Frith's badly burned body was recovered, police had enough evidence to charge three men. John Ashley, Dean Carr and Mark Martin were all accused of murder. But when reports came in of more missing girls, police realised they were dealing with a potential serial killer. Mark Martin arrived on the scene in Nottingham without warning, and within two months, three people were dead. So within two months, three people. And he didn't even have an alcohol problem, so you can't blame it on liquor or drugs. Like, he just was... He checked out mentally or something. In January 2005, Nottinghamshire police were investigating the murder of a young homeless woman. Ellen Frith had been strangled at her makeshift squat in Marple Square before the flat was set alight. Three suspects had been arrested, all of them part of the city's homeless community. At the center was Mark Martin, a violent, manipulative man who had recently arrived on the streets. He had even boasted to other homeless people about killing Ellen. But as police spoke to more homeless people, they heard rumors that Martin had claimed to be a multiple killer. Whilst many of them were telling us that Mark Martin admitted killing Ellen, they were also disclosing some quite worrying information about other girls. And what we started to learn was that Mark Martin had spoken about two girls in particular. Some of the people from the homeless community actually knew both of those girls and they knew them as Katie Baxter and as Zoe Pennick. Police discovered that neither girl had been seen for more than a month. See, this is the type of, like, this is the type of documentary, like, the crime documentary, you gotta pay close attention, you gotta follow the plot, you can't lose the plot. That's why I'm so engulfed in it. <laughs> you know? And their disappearances were out of character. They would be seen almost daily. Everybody knew them. They were really nice, friendly girls. and Everybody was fond of them and spoke about them a lot. And it, they were almost conspicuous by their absence through that period. Where are Katie? Where are Zoe? So our attention started to focus on them. Police scoured the city, looking for any link between the girls and Mark Martin. Their investigation led them to an abandoned warehouse close to Nottingham city centre. It was a makeshift base for the city's homeless, 
and a place the girls had been known to visit. If you come around the corner, you'll see on the left-hand side there's a really big area of wasteland. If you walked along here back in 2004, all of what's now overgrown wasn't, and so you could see across and you could see the remnants of tents and bivouacs and man-made shelters really where several homeless people were staying. Away from prying eyes, the warehouse was a safe retreat for those sleeping rough. And since he arrived on the streets, <coughs> it had also been home to Mark <coughs> Martin. Excuse me. I don't even think the average citizen would be going to be knowing that it's a whole other underworld around them. Like, yeah, we all see a couple homeless people on the street, like panhandling, trying to get food, this things and that, things of that nature. But we don't be realizing how deep it really be. It really be deep. They got whole communities. Like a whole warehouse full of air, air homeless people. Ominously, it was where he boasted of killing two other girls. It had also been home to Mark Martin. Ominously, it was where he boasted of killing two other girls. He's killed once. He had been bragging about killing Ellen. He made no secret of that. He seemed to be quite proud of the fact that he'd killed Ellen. When we start to receive information that he'd been bragging about killing other girls, in the back of our minds, have we stumbled across here a serial killer? A little bit. A systematic search was launched. Police dogs and forensic teams scoured the sprawling site for any evidence of where... I'm, I'm lost why he got in there and started bragging like he was surrounded by a bunch of killers, like he was in a, in a penitentiary... Cat A went cat cat A building next to the rest of the city. These are homeless people. They just trying to live. They trying to get by. They probably stuck. They probably down on bad times. Like they're not trying to be worried about you. You probably going to jail, buddy. Like why would you even talk on that? You want a glorification on it? Like you idiot. <laughs> Where Katie and Zoe could be. And they quickly discovered two bodies. Looking at the warehouse from here, they were quite a way in and against the far wall where there was a pile of rubble and, and brickwork. A half-hearted effort had been made to bury them in that brickwork, uh, one on top of the other. Probably didn't think nobody was really going to come search for them. We've come down here to look for Katie and Zoe, and it was Katie and Zoe that we found. Police now had three victims, all of whom had been living on the streets. It appeared that Martin's sinister tales of murder had been true, and he was charged with all three deaths. His accomplice, John Ashley, was charged with two of the murders. Dean Carr was charged with one. Twelve months later, the three appeared at Nottingham Crown Court. The jury heard how Martin relished becoming Nottingham's first serial killer. One witness recalled him saying, if you kill one, you might as well kill 21. It shows a total... That's a messed up thought process, but like... You, you, for one, you're going to jail for life. For 21, you're going to jail for life as well, so... But like, I, I ain't gonna... I, I, you too? I don't condone what he is talking about, but that's that's a that's a wild statement to make. But in the judicial system, you know, because there's no death penalty in the UK, is there? I don't know. A lack of regard for human life, Clearly. but also a real lack of regard for the consequences to himself of saying such an outlandish thing. It seems that he's totally consumed with what that means for him and his identity as a serial killer. Yeah, like there's no death penalty in the UK, so it's like... R.I.P. to all the women he killed, but what he said, he ain't wrong when he said that, though. But like mentally, that's messed up. Like he he wrong, but he ain't. If you get caught, what's the difference? I think that's you know. I'm trying to not. I'm trying to be politically correct here, but like that, that's tough. A very dangerous man. 
After five weeks listening to evidence, the jury found the men guilty on all charges. The judge commented that Mark Martin had enjoyed killing and had shown no remorse. Clearly. He said the crimes were so horrific that Martin should never be released from prison. That sentence is saved for the most serious of murders. Oh, okay, so there is a separate sentence. Probably no parole, ever. And this, in my view, is one of those. Okay, what's the sentence? Hold on, did we miss what was the sentence? Dean Carr was given 14 years for killing Ellen Frith. And John Ashley was sentenced to 25 years for the murders of Frith and Katie Baxter. For two murders, he got 25 years. You see, like, that's it? But it For one murder, the other dude got 14. Like, the UK be so weird to me when it comes to stuff like that. It's Mark Martin who will be remembered as Nottingham's most serious multiple killer. He arrived on the scene in Nottingham without warning, and within two months, three people were dead. I fear that had he not been caught when he was caught, that he would have gone on and killed others. Thankfully, he was caught and convicted and will now spend the rest of his life behind bars, and that, frankly, is where he belongs. I feel like he wanted to be caught, though, kind of. Mark Martin became one of just 46 serious offenders for whom life really means life. Whole life sentences are really very rare. We don't give them out easily, not even to murderers, because we know that it's very rare for somebody, once they've killed, to be released from prison and then kill again. I'm pretty sure there's a study behind that, but hearing it is crazy. In America, you kill, you're going to jail for life. You're done. <laughs> you're done. Although, sadly, it has happened. Ernest Wright is one killer who would be released back into society. They let Ernest go? In 1971, after falling in love with a married woman, Wright had hatched a plan to... Ernest burnt a body on a bonfire in front of a in front of the in front of the in front of the victim's wife, and they let that man go. Dispose of her husband. I don't even know what was happening. The unfortunate man was lured to Wright's caravan on a remote airfield, and as the husband slept, Wright struck with an iron bar. The following morning, Ernest Wright forced Ruth to watch as her husband's body was burned on a bonfire. Wright was eventually found guilty of the murder and sent to prison. But after serving 26 years behind bars, Wright was a free man. 26 years. Wright returned to his hometown of Bradford. He moved into an upstairs flat on Howarth Crescent and soon became a recognised part of the local community. The first time I was introduced to him was um, when my mum had said that this were her new neighbour that lived above her. His neighbour was Melissa Crocker, who quickly introduced him to her son, Craig Freer. First impressions were he seemed like a, a, nice, a nice man. A harmless, small, old man. Melissa suffered with a disability and mental health conditions, mm. and so Craig checked on her regularly. I used to go see my mum every day, sometimes a few times a day, and he always... So, 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 upstairs neighbour who just got out of jail, he already looking at her, seeing her, perceiving her as a victim. Someone that he could... You know, easily. We seemed to be about and always called down once a day to make sure that she were all right. Did she need anything? They did build up a, a quite a good friendship. Wright was given the impression of a caring neighbour, but his behaviour started to arouse suspicion. She used to see him stood at her window looking in at her. You ain't got to register as a killer or nothing? 
like, like, like. So you do that type of you you te- you catch an M charge in the UK. You get out twenty one years later to however many years later, and you're not on a registry or you're not like not. There's nothing to alert people of anything. He used to shine a torch into a face. This one's not the serial killer. The other one is, but I mean, apparently he is. Wright was also getting inside his neighbor's home. He managed to get a key off of my mum. He was going through her cupboards and in other rooms when she wanted. And when Craig called him one Wednesday evening in March 2009, things took a sinister turn. The lights were off, uh, the curtains were drawn, and it were all locked up. She wasn't there. Everything had basically gone. All items had gone. Personal possessions, clothes, coats, even the ornaments had gone. Melissa's sudden disappearance was out of character. She was vulnerable and never away from home for long. And with Ernest Wright's flat empty as well, Craig quickly put two and two together. Mm. I thought he'd taken her against her will and he'd somehow (coughs) brainwashed her or manipulated her. Craig was taking care of his mother's bills and it wasn't long before he got a phone call moving her accounts to a new address in nearby Stubbing Way. Angry and concerned, Craig and his ex-partner Neville went to check out the property. Ernest was in the garden. I said to him that if my mum's with you, can I please speak to her because I'm concerned. Neville said to him, I bet you never thought you'd be found here. And Ernest had a shovel in his hand at the time and he picked the shovel up as if to swipe it at us, like to get away. Neville picked up a nearby stick and defended himself and caught Ernest right on on the face. With no sign of Melissa, Craig went to the police to report the whole story. And dude that hit him with the stick probably got five years in jail for defending him, so that's crazy. Bizarrely, his mum was also at the station making a complaint about him. I said to her, what are you doing here? Huh? And she said that Ernest had told her to get an harassment order put out on me and Neville to keep away from her. Ernest Wright was in complete control. Once more, he'd taken advantage of a vulnerable woman and divided a family. Over the weekend, Craig and Neville kept trying to make contact, concerned that Melissa was in danger. Finally, on Sunday, I didn't expect that. Then just went to Sunday. Craig spoke with his mother. He made an arrangement to meet the following day, and hoped to persuade her to leave Wright for good. Monday morning, I got a shower, got everything ready, what I needed came downstairs as I opened the door I saw someone stood straight in front of me I remember freezing I thought about oh okay this is the full story okay 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 slamming the door but I couldn't because the person put the foot straight over the door I don't feel like this is an accurate (laughs) reenactment couldn't because the person put the foot straight over slam you gotta remember there's a big difference because at the beginning they said it was a sawn off shotgun this is this a full barrel double barrel shotgun you know what i'm saying me personally i mean you know you never know what you're gonna do in these situations but like a full shotgun i'm gonna grab it and move it <laughs> if you don't come in and immediately pull that joint i'm gonna grab it and move it i'm six two i'm big as hell you're gonna have to bust pause I ain't going out like that. But once again, like I told y'all, me personally, I'm talking about, hold on, let me show y'all a reenactment of how I would have opened the door like that. Hold on. Okay, hold on, hold on. I got to figure it out. Can y'all hear me? Okay, y'all can hear me, right? All right, bet. I'm gonna show you how I would have did it. 
R.I.P. once again. This the dough. This the outside, this the inside. This me, okay? Who is it? I don't hear nothing. No reply, okay. The blick, hold on, let me show y'all. The blick in here. Who is it? Who is it? Opening the door. He walk in. Woo, 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 woo. Call the police, give me a nice little cup of tea, wait on them. You, you feel me? I was walking around the crib though in Chicago. Blick in hoodie. My gun was legal in Chicago, so YouTube, remember I'm in America. <laughs> but I know this is not America, but I'm just saying how I'm coming. I'm in the door, but I couldn't because the person put the foot straight over the door. I knew straight away, definitely it were Ernest Wright, 100%. Never came straight across the, the landing. In the UK, you gotta remember, dude is about 70, 60 years old. The dude that's coming in the door, of course, he don't know that, but at, at a certain point, you know, if I grew up where I grew up, and I was to, and I've been through what I've been through, and I moved to the UK right now, and that situation was to happen to me, I don't know. I'm not. I don't know, man. You never. You can say what you're gonna do. It might not play out like that, but what I like to think I would do is, you know, what I'm saying it's fight or flight. I'm not running. You can't outrun that. You cannot outrun that. You gotta face it head up. It's in your face. Split moment decision at that point. You either gonna lay down or, or, or you gonna, you know what I'm saying? Like at this point, you know, you breaking in my, I don't know what's going on in your head. What mental stability level you at? I just don't know. In the UK, no guns. That ain't stopping the criminals from getting them, so. You get me. Down the stairs. Not saying that I can do that, YouTube, I'm just saying. Ernest Wright put the, the gun up straight away to an angle and shot Neville in the chest. I just... Yeah, see what I'm saying? He came to get his get back. He got hit in the face with a stick. Of course, they don't know who that is. But you can assume. Spun round, ran straight up the stairs, ran into the bathroom. I shut the door behind me and we're just shouting and screaming for help. You see what I'm saying? Flight, <laughs> flight or fight took over and he chose flight. He chose to go upstairs, put himself in the worst position in the bathroom. You know, he did what he could, like, but at the same time, man, hey, listen. Where I'm running to? <laughs> I heard somebody's footsteps. Another shot went off. I heard Neville say to me, Craig, where are you? I'm dying. <laughs> My bad, I ain't mean to lie. He said, Neville said, Craig, where are you? I'm dying. Craig is not, Craig is in the bathroom trying to get up out of there. This is an unfortunate situation. RIP to every victim. That has fallen, you know, but hey, Craig at the door should have met him with animosity. And then there were another shot and the bathroom door, like it just blew in. There were bits of wood and glass. It just all, all came in at me. I went to the bathroom window, opened it and climbed out. I just 
So the bathroom big and the bathroom window was big and okay. Just remember running as quickly as I could up my driveway and then out and up the road. I just wanted to get as far away as I could. Back in the house, Wright pursued Neville Corby from room to room before executing him at point blank range. Meanwhile, Craig was hiding under a neighbor's car, barely clinging to life. I just looked, barely clinging. Did it hit him? The gun, the... Looked down to my right hand side, and all this blood was just, oh, okay. just gushing out, just coming up. I remember I kept telling myself that I don't want to die in this street. I don't want to die like this. I just kept trying to fight and fight and stay conscious. The gunman calmly made his escape. Paramedics and a worried neighbour were soon tending to Craig. I remember her saying to me, who's done this, do you know who it was? And I was finding it really difficult to speak, but I knew that just in case I didn't make it, I had to get the name of the person that had done it. And I said, it were Ernest Wright. I just knew that it were him. Police were quickly on the scene. You see what I'm saying? So he said he knew that it was, he just knew unequivocally. So I'm pretty sure at the door, when he first opened that door, he knew that it was him. I can, I'm, I'm going to draw that conclusion that he knew it was him when he opened that door. And when he seen that shotgun. But also at the same time, I got to take into account that it was not a double barrel full shotgun. It was a sawn off. So... It, like, everything I might be saying is irrelevant because you can grab that double barrel, but that, that sawn off, you got to get a little bit closer. The person that, that's holding it got a little more time. 20 minutes after the shooting, with one man dead and another on his way to hospital, Chris Thompson launched a manhunt. He soon discovered details of Wright's criminal past including his conviction for murder, his powers of persuasion, and his ability to run from the law. It was very clear that there were real parallels between these two uh, murders. In both cases, Ernest Wright had befriended uh, very vulnerable women. Uh, he was a controlling character. He began to take over their lives. And uh, in both cases, it was when this control was challenged that he would very quickly resort to extremes of violence. Scene of crime officers quickly plotted out the events of the morning and they learned that Wright had spent several minutes stalking his victims through the property. And all this painted a picture of a, a very calm, collected individual, um, totally in control of his emotions and uh, an almost militaristic approach uh, to what he was doing. In the light of the fact that we're dealing with a 68-year-old man here, uh, this was all you know, quite, quite surprising. Do you think this was a random attack or was were these individuals deliberately targeted? I think this was a, a, a focused, targeted killing. We decided at that stage that, that we would take a rather unusual step and that, and that was to release details of Ernest Wright to the media. Uh, not something that we would commonly do, but in this kind of case, um, public safety is absolute, absolutely paramount. This is a brutal uh, killing of a, of a 40 year old man. Uh, and it's very, very important that Mr. Wright comes forward and assists us with our inquiries in respect to this matter. We couldn't discount that uh, Ernest Wright would, would go on to, to kill again. In Bradford, one man is dead and another lies critically injured. Craig Freer and his ex-partner Neville oh. have been attacked in their own home. The prime suspect is Ernest Wright, a career criminal who has been taking advantage of Craig's vulnerable, disabled mother. Detectives have discovered that Wright has a previous conviction for murder. Now... The <laughs> detectives have discovered. Like, that, 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 though, the way he phrased it made it sound like they had to do, like, some, a deep dive... 
let's uncover a mystery. He changed his name. He 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 like got it. Like did something with the file or like all you got to do is type in his name. They need to prove he's the masked gunman who has attempted to kill two more. And they quickly make a significant breakthrough. CCTV images recovered from security cameras at Craig's house show the offender preparing his attack. Ernest Wright had been outside the premises in the very early hours of the morning. You could see that he was balaclavered up wearing some sort of combat jacket. Uh, and he'd attempted to actually move the CCTV. Failed. But despite his efforts, the cameras still catch Ernest Wright in the act. There was also CCTV that showed him going to the back of the garden and secreting himself behind a garden shed and waiting. He then approaches the house. What followed was a brutal double shooting but minutes afterwards, the same cameras capture Wright leaving the scene and making off in Craig's car. By mid-morning, Wright had driven across Bradford, collected Craig's mum, Melissa, and taken her shopping. She was totally unaware of the horrific attack Wright had just inflicted on her son. He was obviously aware that there was a lot of police activity. I'm sure she immediately snapped out of it, like, whoa, what did you do? The helicopter was around. Uh, there were armed police officers on the street. It's at that point that he left the area. For several days, police searched for Wright until information arrived in the most bizarre way. I received a letter addressed to myself, um, allegedly written by Ernest Wright. He made it very clear that he wasn't responsible for the killing and that uh, he intended to sail across the water and start a new life in Ireland where we would never find him. More letters would follow. In one, Wright gave police a full alibi, accounting for his movements on the morning of the murder. He claimed to have been in a cafe with Melissa at the time of the shooting. He clearly thinks that he can set up an alibi for himself and he can tell the police where he was at certain times and they'll just take that at face value. Right. And of course what it does is it just creates even more suspicion. Police check... Hey, you're not doing any favours for yourself right now. Wright's story and found more CCTV footage that appeared to support his account. Here he's seen shopping for cigarettes in a local supermarket. And here... He's visiting a nearby petrol station. Okay. But the alibi wasn't exactly as Ernest Wright had made it seem. We were able to calibrate the CCTV and show that uh, uh, whilst Ernest Wright's route was very accurate, uh, his timing was out by an hour. And in fact, um, he did uh, complete that route, but a very short time after the killing. Yeah, like there's no time stamp, like they wouldn't go and really go search. Wright had intentionally made the trip, knowing cameras would pick up his trail. But crucially, everything had taken place more than an hour after he had calmly left the murder scene. Yeah, buddy. Say goodbye. In hospital, after undergoing emergency surgery, Craig Freer regained consciousness. I'd been shot in the chest under my arm. The hole from the cartridge had made a eight centimetres by 10 centimetre hole, and that I'd had roughly 150 pellets inside me. I went through... 150 pellets? 24 pints of blood. As soon as they were putting it in, it was just coming straight out. As soon as he was well enough, police had to break the devastating news. Neville had died. I think he knew that in the back of his mind, though. I, I was just really shocked. I didn't believe it. I just didn't believe it. Craig also learned that his attacker was still on the loose. I actually thought, I'm, I'm a key witness now. I actually know it were him. I said it were him. He might come and try and find me, even though the police had put six officers with me that were armed just outside my room and they were there 24 hours but I still thought he might find a way of getting to me 
police received numerous sightings as the appeal spread, and they soon got a breakthrough. A number of days into the investigation, we uh, received some information that he was uh, possibly at a house in the locality, in the Bradford area, and this was a home of a, an elderly lady. We responded with the firearms team, and Ernest Wright was at the address, and he surrendered to the firearms team. Wright had dyed his beard and changed his appearance, but his manipulation... Wright had dyed his beard and changed... to the firearms team. Wright had dyed his beard and changed his... That is clearly the same person. His appearance... Did not work. But his manipulation of a vulnerable woman was all too familiar. He'd befriended her. She completely trusted him. She was aware of the, of the killing. She was aware that he was wanted for the killing. Uh, but she'd made that decision that she would protect him. So she's an accomplice now. Once again, it's just that characteristic of, of, of Ernest Wright that he was very manipulative and persuasive um, in those kind of circumstances. So you With the time. evidence overwhelming, Wright stood trial at Newcastle Crown Court. In March 2010, a jury found him guilty. And did what, though? What was his sentence this time? His face didn't move, didn't change. It was just exactly the same as before the verdict had come through. Just no movement, no emotion, nothing. Not at all. The judge um, was very clear in deciding that uh, despite Ernest Wright's age, he continued to be highly dangerous and, uh, and in doing so sentenced him um, to spend the rest of his life in prison. Ernest Wright's 60-year criminal career was finally brought to an end. And I brought... It had started at the age of eight with a petty theft included a vicious murder with an iron bar and ended with a brutal double shooting. For Maurice Caro, the detective who first captured Wright, this latest murder was a surprise. I honestly didn't think Wright had the guts to do another murder. Mine. I don't think he had the guts to do another... Section of a gun makes you brave, doesn't it? In both the murder in 1971 and uh, the murder of Neville Corby, he showed an absolutely callous um, disregard for human life and uh, showed himself to be a, a very cold, very uh, ruthless uh, killer. And so Wright was added to the list of the UK's most oh, okay. dangerous offenders. Never. One of 46 who will never be released from jail. Justified. There's no other sentence they could give him, is there? Once he's committed two. Although he'll never be free, the memories of Ernest Wright continue to haunt his victim. I still don't like the thought of... the thought of him still actually being alive. I still have nightmares about it. I still question things that happened. I I'm positive you got PTSD. I wonder how his relationship with his mom is. Still get panicky. To me, the scariest thing about the old ordeal was not the actual gun. It was the fact that somebody been at the door in a balaclava. <sighs> it's interesting. TLO, leave a like, comment. Let me know your thoughts, man. I'm gone.